Well, welcome to a new ATCC webinar presented by Max Gotts, one of our ATCC members. The webinar title is Investing in Argentina as a Foreign Investor. I'm Lucas Lombardi, your host and moderator for this session. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, let me take a moment to introduce ourselves and give you a brief overview of who we are and what we do. The Argentina and Texas Chamber of Commerce is an independent, non-profit, voluntary membership association founded in 2016 to promote investment, trade, education, and networking opportunities between Texas and Argentina. The Chamber is dedicated to building a strong economic bond between Argentina and Texas. In this webinar, we will explore opportunities and strategies to make informed real estate investments in the Argentinian market. Our speaker today is Maximiliano Gotts. Max is the director of MGNI, Max Gotts Negocios Inmobiliarios, and a respected member of the Argentinian real estate community who brings tons of know-how and experience to the webinar. Finally, we would, like, we would like to thank you, our corporate members, for the for the continuous sorry for the continuous support of the chamber. There are Pan American Energy, Gruralite, Globant, and PCR, as well as AESA, Marvelo Farrell Marial, Mayor Brown, Ratia, Frochet, and Q Advance. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, and uh, we will read all the, the questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have any question, please uh, post it on the Q&A uh, chat, and we will read them to Max once he finishes. Thank you, Max. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lucas, and everybody at ATCC. And thank you all for making the time today and your interest in uh, Argentina and Argentine real estate. This webinar is going to be, I think, particularly interesting because of the recent socioeconomic changes um, that I'm sure everybody knows about, the, uh, the new presidency and, um, and everything that is, is soon to follow. So... Um, very briefly about myself, as Lucas indicated, I'm um, the director of uh, our, my own law firm, Emegots Negocios Inmobiliarios, or MGNI for short, member of the uh, Realtors Association for the City of BA, for the province of BA, and a member of uh, the National Association of Realtors in the United States. Um, I penned a short ebook um, which details the process of property purchase. Uh, in English, in as much details as possible. Been speaker in a few uh, conventions, mainly a Vacation Rental Management Association, and uh, I I have the honor of being the only licensed Argentine realtor to have been on uh, HTV's House Hunters International, which was great fun to do. So, uh, without further ado, let's get to it and um, start with this. So, the purpose of this webinar is I think gonna be threefold. We're gonna be looking to give the foreign investor a clear outline of what they can expect when it comes to real estate in Argentina and what the, pro what the, the purchase, uh, the procedure, I'm sorry, for buying is like from start to finish. Uh, give an accurate assessment of what, um, what it means to own real estate in Argentina why you would want to or not, because maybe you'll find it's not the right fit for you, and what the market is currently doing and what has been doing um, on, a, on a historic basis. Let me just minimize this. And of course, to warn about potential pitfalls um, and explaining all the while cultural, financial, and legal backdrop to these items. So there are two questions first and foremost that we get asked a lot. Is it easy for a foreigner to buy a property in Argentina? And number two, can the government seize my property? The answer to the former is uh, yes, it's easy enough to buy property. There are no major restrictions, if any restrictions. Um, there are some restrictions when you're talking about something more complex, 
such as land and such as land when it's close to bodies of water or borders, but we can discuss that further down the line as it's more of a specific niche. And the question, uh, question number two is, can the government use my property? That is a resounding no. Um, even in the most left-leaning governments that the country has ever known, we've never even had a whiff of a possibility of the government looking towards uh, foreign-owned assets and, and taking them. So that is not something that, that people need to worry about. We do also get a third question, uh, less so of late, but there's been historically another question which is, which is asked a lot. Given the, the weakness of the Argentine peso, our local currency, can I buy uh, property in pesos? The dollar right now is at a 1,000 peso to one ratio. So it begs the question, if I come in with fewer dollars, can I buy with Argentine pesos? And the answer to that, I'm sorry to say, is no. Real estate um, is value in US dollars. It is the one go-to commodity which people of all social strata go to. And there, there really is, you're, you're gonna be very hard pressed. I would say it would be almost impossible nowadays to find anybody who would sell their property in Argentine pesos. Um, the, the market of real estate has been informally dollarized because obviously I say informally because the Argentine peso is the, is the legal tender for Argentina. Now, um, it's been informally dollarized back since hailing back to the 1970s and it's always been the go-to investment. Now, that lets me segue into the following. Um, why is real estate so important? I mean, it's no surprise to anyone that real estate has historically been one of several ways that people invest the world over and since you know the dawn of modern economy. Um, it would be, it's important to indicate that socially Argentina, as, as most of you know or not, uh, we are descent, we are a country of immigrants predominantly Italians. And the Italian mindset has always been buy land, own land, you must have land. And so much so that when the first swath of Italian immigrants came in, they would buy a house, they would then build back towards the house and they would bring in the rest of their family once they were settled in and they were doing well. These houses are referred to as chorizo style houses and you can still see them in the Palermo areas as they are um, deeper than they are wider, hence the name chorizo or sausage. Um, what do you need insofar as paperwork goes for the purposes of buying real estate? Well, you're going to need a valid passport and uh, possibly a second form of ID. Some people might ask, most don't. But the real important thing that you need is what's called a CDI, which is an acronym for Clave de Identificación, which um, basically replaces or, or is a unique tax ID number, which allows a foreigner to buy uh, real estate or really any registrable good. Um, it replaces what we refer to as quit or quid, which are our unique, as Argentine citizens, our unique um, identification numbers before AFIP. AFIP is uh, the local version of the IRS. So, Let's get down to the process from start to finish. Uh, and let me preface this by saying that um, I suppose any seasoned investor of real estate will, will want to know what they're looking for. And if they don't know what they're looking for, they'll probably do their due diligence and see if there is something that they want or maybe realize, hey, I didn't know that this was available. Maybe I want this. So you first have to, uh, think inductively or, or, or to the inside and say, okay, what do I like? What is it that I like? Do I like a building? Do I like a condo? Do I like a house? Do I like something on the hills? Do I like something by the beach? And then what do I need? Well, I've got a, a, some money saved up from retirement. Um, I think that I would like to have a house by the beach because I've always lived in Sedona. I've always lived in the desert. So now I want to be by the beach. Um, or I... Um, I have this amount of money, so I really can't afford that, but I can afford this. What do I want out of it? Is it something that I want just because I want to make myself happy? Do I want to get some manner of short return on investment, medium return on investment, 
long return on investment? Do I want to flip it? There's any number of, of options and it's always gonna go back to who wants what out of it. The price objectively is gonna be a factor. And why do I say objectively versus subjectively? Objectively is gonna to refer to what the market is doing. If the market speaks to a one bedroom property being in the vicinity of $100,000 in Recoleta, overlooking the park, overlooking the cemetery, whatever, um, and you're seeing something for $130,000, then we're gonna be looking at something which is overpriced to the tune of 30%. Now, subjectively speaking, you might think, well, you know what, it's still a deal, or I don't care, or I've just fallen in love with this and I want it. So of course, it's gonna be those two factors which are gonna come into play. Here's a roadmap of what the process uh, would encompass which is essentially four steps, which can be whittled down to three. Step number one is to make an offer. And this is really not unlike anything that you might see in the United States, in Canada, Europe. Um, you and I are out uh, looking at apartments. I show you one, two, five things. And your heart is set on the second thing I showed you, which is a two bedroom, two bathroom, gas bathroom, pool, this, that, the next thing the whole nine yards and you like it very much and the asking price is two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars you are looking to spend in and around 210 so you would make an offer a letter of intent is drafted with some earnest money so that the buyer can see that it's a serious offer from a serious buyer you say i hereby I'm, I'm i'm paraphrasing but i hereby offer the amount of 210 for the property located on you know main street one two three um, that is sent over to the, um, to the, uh, seller. And, um, so by the way, the earnest money, uh, the offer, the offer is accompanied by a monetary sum, uh, which is of course what we refer to as the earnest money it can range between 2000, 6,000. It'll depend on the amount of the deal. Um, and it serves as, uh, a, a, a real, interest showing gesture to the seller that uh, you as a buyer are in the market to purchase. Um, a couple of things can happen. What we would expect, what we would hope is that the offer would be accepted. But in reality, one of four things can happen. The offer is accepted. That is the broker relayed the, um, the offer to the seller. The seller said, okay, I can live with that amount. 210 sounds good. Uh, I'll take it. Offer is rejected. Seller might say, ah, that, that's too low. I don't want to take the offer. Offer is countered where they'll say, if they're, if they're uh, motivated to sell, they'll say 210 is a bit on the low side, but um, I could live with 235. And then it'll be up to you as a buyer to say, ah, 235 works or ah, 235 is still above my, my budget. Um, or offer is accepted, but you decide that you don't want to move forward. Maybe you saw something else. Maybe you've decided for whatever reason it's not for you. Now, in point number four, point number four is the only circumstance under which the earnest money you left would be lost because it is at that point that there is a binding agreement between both parties and the other party um, uh, in an effort to keep some compensatory uh, monies for the time involved and for the other party not honoring that deal keeps that earnest money. For all other options, you get your money back. Well, if the offer is accepted, that money is put towards the sale. If the offer is rejected, you get your money back. If the offer is countered and you do not accept that counter, you get your money back. Uh, so insofar as the offer being accepted, we can move towards item number three, which is the signing of what's called a boleto. Boleto de compraventa, as it's called here, is essentially a private document before uh, signed by the two parties, the buyer and the seller. And culturally, what happens there is that 30% of the price of the property is uh, paid, in addition to the broker's fee, which is typically 4% to the buyer, 3% to the seller. Uh, and both parties pay a commission, by the way. 
I know it's different in other in other pockets around the world, but in Argentina, both parties pay a commission. So the, the boleto will be signed. And what it'll be is a promise to go from that stage to the final stage, which is stage four, the escritura or the deed. And we'll get to this, but the deed, which is the final step and the most important step, is the one wherein the notary public, who is considerably different from the concept of a notary public in, say, the United States and Canada, uh, he is wholly responsible for the deal being completely on level and without any risk. He is the title insurance company. He is the person who witnesses the sale, the purchase, make sure the money is accounted for. He is the last line of protection for both parties. So he's a very, very integral part of the process. So to that end, uh, the boleto also act as a letter of intent of sorts where further information is drafted, the date for the final payment, the method of payment, location of the signing of the deed, and any other particulars that the parties involved want to leave clear. For example, uh, the buyer may want the air conditioning units to be left, or the buyer may want for the seller to paint it because it needs a coat of paint, or they may want to wait until the final deed and sign it three months uh, from the moment of signing of the boleto because, I don't know, they have a trip coming up. They've got... Um, uh, a, a job thing or, or just anything that would otherwise mean that they can't sign it sooner than later. All of these things are negotiable. Each and every one of these points are negotiable. So to that end, the signing of the escritura, which is the final step. As I mentioned, the notary public referred to here as escribano is very different from the concept one knows in the US or in Canada, where it's just a guy with a rubber stamp at Kinko's just stamping a piece of paper. He is the one who uh, takes all the information. He's also referred to as un agente de retención because the buyer will pay the taxes for that. The notary will take those taxes and under his responsibility, pay those taxes to AFIP, again, the local IRS. So he is completely 100% responsible. Now, among other reasons, it is also it is for this reason that it is incredibly hard to become a notary public in Argentina. Uh, more often than not, uh, people are second or third or fourth generation notaries, and they are people that um, have to be very, very precise and surgical with the deed because uh, that deed is then recorded at the county registrar's office and um, can't be opposed, which is to say, someone comes to me and says, you know, Max, that property is not yours, it's mine. And I have the deed, which says that it is mine and it is recorded at the county registrar's office. So once that's done, once it's signed before a notary, no one can say the opposite. No one can, can contest that, which is to say, you are completely protected. It is, it is, it is completely, it a complete fail-safe protection. Now, as a quick sidebar, um, we get this question a lot. We don't have uh, escrow in Argentina. The concept does not exist. There are not companies in Argentina that do this. Um, so because there's no escrow and there's no home inspection, which is mandatory, if any buyer were to want to take further measure to make sure that the property was healthy, that it had no no issues with, you know, water damage or, or anything that we refer to as vicios ocultos or loosely translated hidden vices or hidden, you know, issues with it. One can uh, hire either an architect or a construction specialist and do that. And and we sometimes do do that when it comes to the purchase of older houses or or things of that nature. And again, the the LOI is 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 um, is is written up, and it can be as detailed or not as the parties agree. It's important to indicate that the LOI has to be legally possible and physically possible, because if not, if it goes before a court, uh, one or the other parties might have a problem. Legally possible means, as an example, uh, you can't agree to murder because it's not legal. And physically possible means you can't agree to selling the house with a pink elephant inside of it because there's no such thing as a, as a, as a pink elephant. Um, now, a short alternative, which we like to talk about a lot, is 
doing away with step number three altogether, we eschew the signing of the boleto, and you go straight to the signing of the Ejidura. And there really is no reason why you can't do that. For the most part, the signing of the boleto, the middle stage of that is done so that, uh, because that's the point in which the broker collects their commission. So a lot of brokers would rather collect their money sooner than later. Um, now, the problem that I personally have with that is that it presents a risk, not a big risk, a very small risk, but a risk all the same. You sign a boleto wherein you're putting down 30% as a buyer, you're putting down 30% of the purchase price. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, let's call it a catastrophe and the seller dies or the seller becomes incapacitated. And then the children, the heirs didn't know that the sale was going through or they were not in agreement with it. That 30% is left in a sort of a legal limbo where best case scenario, you talk to the, to the seller or the seller's proxy or the seller's kid and say, hey, look, I was fixing to do this with your parents or with your mother or your father. They fell into a coma. So can I please get my money back? If, if they're you know, amenable to that, they'll give you the money back. If not, you know, one never knows. Um, I've been doing this since 1996. I've never had a case of that happening, which isn't to say it can't happen tomorrow. Um, and so as a result, whenever possible, we try to go straight to the signing of the Escritura, which is the deed, which is, again, where the Escribano meets with everyone, witnesses the signature, the money is transferred to the buyer, to the seller, the keys are given to the buyer, and everyone um, is happy. Let's talk a little bit about money. Um, how do you actually, how do you physically buy property? And this is where a lot of um, people kind of are left a little agape with how culturally things are, things are handled here. Now, what we try to do, because we have a lot of, of, of overseas clientele, what we try to do is we try to uh, play matchmaker to a buyer and a seller, both of whom will have an account overseas. Call it Bank of America to Bank of America or Chase to Bank of America or whatever. And so this will be the best way of getting this done um, because it'll be safe, it'll be not expensive, and it'll be not cumbersome. And when I say least expensive, it'll mean not having to wire money into Argentina, which can cost in some cases anywhere between 3% and 5 or 6% wiring the money into Argentina. And you may ask, why would I wire money into Argentina? Which brings me to item number two. 90 or 95% of real estate transactions are done in cash. Picture Clint Eastwood in one of those old uh, Western movies where he's coming in with the bags of money and puts them on the table. That's pretty much what I'm talking about. And I'm not, I'm not uh, embellishing this. People come with the money into the office. The money is counted, sometimes with a machine, sometimes without a machine. Um, but that's how it's done. That's how it's done. It has been the norm for decades. Um, now, in terms of getting the money here, the by the book way is bringing it to uh, a local bank, um, a bank account that you would have to open in your name. If you have a bank account in Bank of America, you'd have to open up an account here also to your name in whatever bank you wanted. Uh, and the money would go from your bank of origin to here, take the money out and then Maybe the seller uh, will take the wire into a local bank. Maybe he'll want cash. That sort of uh, becomes apparent as, as you're moving forward with the deal. Now, step number three um, is a more under the radar option. And it encompasses uh, people using what are commonly called finance firms. It's a sort of a Western union where you, you say to the person, to the person in the firm, you'll say, I need $70,000 here. And they'll say to you, okay, send $70,000 to this account, Chase, uh, Brooklyn, New York, to the name of John Smith. And once they have that confirmation, they release the funds over here. Now it goes without saying that if you do go that route, it needs to be with someone that you trust 100%. Um, as in all walks of life, you wanna make sure that you know who you're working with. Uh, and strictly speaking, since this is an under the radar way of doing it, 
It's not the one that we recommend, but it is the one that most, if not all people avail themselves of because it presents uh, the least bureaucratic and um, easiest way of getting things done because doing it through the bank is, is rather bureaucratic. And there's also something to be said about the confidence or lack thereof that Argentine banks um, generate in, in people. I think most of us uh, local uh, locals who invest will invest in real estate, but not so much in banking, uh, i.e. CDs or, or mutual funds or things of that nature. Um, because historically, banks have not been the most, um, they have been the safest of investment um, tools. What potential problems might you have? What are the pitfalls? What issues could spell out trouble for you. Um, if, if your paperwork would be, I think, one of two, would be the only one of two issues that you could find yourself where you would get into trouble. And I say it's a risk, but not really a risk, because if you've got people who, A, know what they're doing, and B, have your best interest um, and have a fiduciary responsibility to you as a client, this is not a problem you're going to have. Now, our recommendation is before any money is put, I mean, in, in, in addition to the earnest money, but any money or any kind of deal to be struck before anything is done, we want to make sure that the paperwork has all the paper, uh, the, the uh, unit in question has all the paperwork squeaky clean. And that's done by way of what's called um, informes de dominio y de inhibición, which what they do is they tell the buyer that uh, the seller, John Smith, okay, yes, he is who he says he is, perfect. And okay, perfect. There's no liens or embargoes. He doesn't have a messy divorce. He doesn't owe the government money. Okay, so this is a property which is not under any manner of embargo or lien or mortgage or anything that would otherwise in any way impede a sale or create a problem to a potential buyer. The second issue we talked about, vicios ocultos or vicios redivitorios, which are aspects of the property um, which you are ethically and legally required to know. Um, house haunted. I don't think we're going to run to a haunted house, but um, there could be humidity. There could be flooding. There could be something that we're not being disclosed, which we should be disclosed. And this would be grounds for damages case against the owner, against the broker, um, even against the tenants board if it were a building. So those are issues that we, we take steps to try to um, skirt so that, or not skirt, but to, to take adequate measure that there's nothing wrong going on there. And a lot of these things you can tell immediately as you walk into a property, it's, it's, it's easy enough to, to know. Now, um, one of the things that happens to us a lot is that um, there are people who, in an effort to maybe go at it alone because they might, as seasoned investors of real estate, or just for whatever reason, uh, go at it alone, um, not realizing that there are several players in, um, in a real estate deal. In the middle of it all, you've got the buyer, naturally. You've got the listing agent, as you would expect in other countries, who's the guy who's got the property that you're interested in seeing. You've got the buyer's broker who might be the person that would represent you, which is a lot of what we do. We get people who want to buy something that isn't necessarily in our listings. And so we go out on the MLS and we search out things and, and, and we're only representing their interests and in trying to negotiate a price and making sure that all the paperwork is sound. You have an accountant who's the guy who has to know how to go through the process of obtaining the CDI, which is not a very difficult thing to do, but the accountant knows the quicker way and the best way to get it done. Uh, lawyer, architect, or engineer also come to mind in terms of anything else that needs to get done from a legal standpoint, such as, is there a probate going on? Uh, architect, maybe you've got an architect you trust or you want to see a building because it's a new building and you want to know, uh, is it a good construction? Is it not a good construction? Same applies to the engineer. And notary, as we've said a, a few times now, will be uh, the all-encompassing last line of defense in making sure that the property um, can can be sold without any any problems to it. So all things being equal, there's no reason why a real estate transaction 
can't take more than 10 days, 12 days on the outside. Uh, it's fairly, once all the paperwork is in place, once everyone has agreed on price, on method of payment, on um, place of signing, it can be done fairly easily. And it can also be done without a person physically in Argentina. Uh, we have had one or two cases where an interested party has not even been in Argentina, um, shown them things via FaceTime or WhatsApp video, Google Meet. And after viewing um, a few more meetings or not, and then they decide to, to move forward with it. So um, there are many ways of, of handling it. Now, it is all about the numbers. And what this is to say is the way that you measure what a property is worth, um, you have to take a Venn diagram into consideration insofar as location, amenities, how old it is, condition it's in, there's a few uh, things which are of great importance, and there's a slew of other secondary things which are uh, less important. Um, the main one is cost per square meter. And the cost per square meter for any uh, determined property in any section of the city will vary greatly. And this is, uh, it's a little bit on the older side, but goes from May to 2005 to May to 2022, which indicates has had the average cost of the square meter has, uh, has varied over time. Um, and made it May of 2019 is when we start to see a considerable decrease and what was probably the first year of what we call the veritable buyer's market. This here measures how many mortgages have been used with the um, property, uh, with the purchase of real estate. Um, notice 2019 to 2022, which again have been, uh, as buyers go, fantastic, as sellers go, abysmal. These were the moments in which it was very hard to get uh, a mortgage. And that has become increasingly so. Uh, it's very hard even to this day to get um, mortgages or personal loans or anything that would otherwise help in the process of buying real estate. Because you got to remember, it's done cash on the barrel head, and it's in U.S. dollars, and people make their money in Argentine pesos. Salaries are in Argentine pesos. Now, and here again, this is several months old, but it still um, stays to, to what the market is doing to a degree. Uh, this is a website, which is one of the most viewed MLS uh, type sites, which indicates at any given moment, you've got 96,566 units up for sale in the city of VA. It doesn't matter the area. You notice the first one says Tantelmo. The second one says Belgrano. Uh, the first one is 125 square meters, three bedroom. The second one is a two bedroom at almost 50 square meters. So it's basically everything. Uh, this is um, from that same period, which is a year ago a stat which indicates how many um, transfers of ownership, how many deeds have been signed December, 2022, which is 4,253. So if you take those two numbers and divide them amongst themselves, what it tells you is that out of 96,566 units in the city and 4,253 sales being done, it gives you 4.41% of transfer of ownership or real estate or, or movement of real estate from A to B, which is very, very, very low. Now that number from then to now has gone up to 7%, 7.2%, which is a good increase to be sure because better to go up than down, but it is still an abysmal uh, percentage, still a very, very low percentage. Um, some of you may be familiar with Buenos Aires, some of you not so much, but um, the areas of interest that um, usually garner the attention of foreign investors, expats and such are Recoleta, to begin with, Palermo, which has been subdivided into different uh, areas such as Palermo Hollywood, Palermo Soho, Palermo Viejo, I'm sure you've, you've, uh, you've heard of these different uh, names. Santelmo, which is a more bohemian uh, feel, a more bohemian area, 
Like any major city, I'm sure you'll appreciate that each area is unique onto itself. Belgrano is another area and the surrounding areas of Belgrano, Chacarita, Colegiales, not to get too much into it, but these are areas that of late have also uh, gotten quite a few, um, quite a few requests for, for viewings of properties. Puerto Madero stands out as the most expensive area in the city of BA. And ironically, it's the one uh, that garners the least interest. Now, I, I don't think I included a picture of Puerto Madero here, but for those of you that have been to Buenos Aires or anyone really who wants to Google it, Puerto Madero is about um, as close as you get to any major city in the United States or Canada. It is uh, chock full of skyscrapers. Um, I would dare say that Puerto Madero lacks the soul that the city of Buenos Aires has. Um, and it also feels a little bit far removed. So uh, we used to have units in Puerto Madero for vacation rentals, and we stopped doing that because we realized that people, they were coming to Buenos Aires for everything that they don't have in other major world-class cities, such as that old Parisian feel, the Italian vibe, um, the more loose kind of, um, uh, I guess, loosey-goosey kind of uh, uh, feel to the culture. And Puerto Madero, it's very new. It's very sleek buildings of 30, 40 stories. So it isn't something that people really um, were very interested in. Um, so that's wonderful and that's all well and good, but what's the purchasing power that I have? I'm flying down to Argentina tomorrow. I wanna to know what I, what I can do. I wanna see what I can buy. I've got $100,000 just sitting there and gosh, I've been to Argentina once or twice. I love it. I'm a tango dancer. I love meat. Uh, what can I do? So let's talk turkey. Uh, these are a few examples over the past couple of months of what we would call motivated sellers who had, uh, for example, a studio in Recoleta, 95,000 US, a studio in Palermo Soho, 99,000 US, studio in San Telmo, 80,000. Then with a one bedroom, 125,000, 135,000, 92,000. And the list continues to two bedroom, two bathroom, three bedroom, two bathroom. Uh, these are prices which um, in, our, uh, in our records have shown that these, uh, these, these numbers were negotiable. The prices in many of these did go down a bit more, but even at that, and even by local standards, these were interesting prices to say nothing of people from overseas, because can you buy anything like this in cities of Canada, cities of the United States, cities of Europe? No, you can't, you really can't. Now, Argentina is, on everybody's lips. It doesn't matter when you hear this. I have come to find in my travels around the world that when you say you're from Argentina, sure, for a while there was Maradona, then it was Messi, then it was the Pope. Uh, now it's the crazy guy who got elected president. So it, before that, I guess it was Evita. And then it was, um, you know, the whole uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber play of Evita and the romance of it all. But for whatever reason, Argentina gets a lot of love and as an Argentine, this makes me very happy and it makes me very proud. Um, and I think it's important to remember, especially for, for those of you out there who are from Europe, that Argentina is a very, very large country. It is the eighth largest geography in the world. We have all climates, we have waterfalls, we have snow, we have icebergs, we have grasslands, we have desert. Um, you can come, at any point in the year, and there's always things to have. For those of you looking for investments uh, other than real estate, Argentina is a very rich resource. I believe that it is the second or third in uh, potable water. Um, oil is very important. There's any number of exports, primarily, of course, beef, but also wheat, sugar. Um, and then finally, uh, but not least important, is I think the culture. Um, time and again, people have told me, I keep coming back to Argentina. I just love the feel. I love coming down, uh, go to my, the restaurant I always go to. Uh, it's affordable. The people are nice. I met my wife there. I married there. You know, any number of reasons for which people uh, love Argentina. And of course, Argentina doesn't end uh, with Buenos Aires. 
Um, another very interesting uh, prospect for investing is Patagonia. Uh, Patagonia is also a word which is very strong in terms of investing and very strong in terms of things to do. It appeals to people because they are into nature, they are into outdoor living, the landscapes, the weather uh, is, is, is beautiful, obviously gets colder in the winter, and that whole area has skiing. Um, the cost of living is lower than in other areas, namely the city of Buenos Aires. Um, and of course, there is the possibility of a short-term return on investment when you rent out that property. We've had many people who have bought uh, boutique hotel type units to then um, have them managed by either Marriott or Hyatt or, or it's changed over the years, but situations where they've had that for a short-term return. Um, so those picturesque landscapes also um, appeal greatly and, and make it a very, a very big hotspot for foreigners. Um, and there are things which can be purchased uh, close to the lake or not close to the lake, um, sometimes with port and moorings. And this is just a for instance, but it can, it can be at a cost of anywhere between $2,000 to $4,000 per square meter. Um, this is just preliminary info, which warrants a whole other, I guess, webinar or conversation for anybody who wishes to reach out to us, because there are certain restrictions as foreigners that are to be had when uh, buying, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, there are certain restrictions that are had when you're a foreigner buying real estate in Argentina, such as proximity to an important body of water, proximity to a national border, um, and things of that nature. So that requires even more due diligence. And to leave you with this, uh, Mark Twain famously said, buy land, they're not making it anymore. Um, and so uh, I'd like to thank you sincerely for your time and, and, and for making the time to uh, meet up through here and to uh, interest in, in Argentine real estate in Argentina altogether. And um, my information is here. And I think that, that the people at the ATCC will also uh, forward it if anyone needs it. And that said, I'm happy to kick it back to Lucas Hello. for uh, Q&A, if anyone has any questions. Well, first, uh, thank you very much, Max. It was really interesting. Yeah, we have some questions. Um, well, I will start with, is there any significant difference between buying something in the city of BA, Buenos Aires, and other points around the country? Well, there's a federal land registrar. So the final outcome of the property, be it a plot of land or an apartment in the city is the same. It's registered from A to B. Now, the deeper you go into either the province of BA or other provinces, you will find that the county registrar's office or the provincial city registrar's office work differently uh, and at slower speeds. Um, so process might take longer. Um, and one very important thing is not so much in the purchase of say a house or something which has physical brick and mortar, but in the process of buying land, and we have cases and have had cases like that, uh, there's a very important player and it's called the Agrimensor, which is the guy who physically goes and compares and contrasts what the deed says to where the land starts and finishes. So that if the deed says that you were buying 3,600 acres, there are indeed 3,600 acres there to be had. And another very, very important aspect is that many plots of land are handed down generation to generation and go back as far as 150 years to when Argentina was, you know, or, or even before that, when Argentina was still being formed as a country. And so there wasn't really a, a, a formal deed. There was what's called a transfer of ownership rights. So that means that in practice, yes, you own possession of it, but there is a risk, sometimes a small risk, sometimes a larger risk, that someone might come out of the woodwork and say, this plot of land belonged to my great, great, great grandfather, and you guys are here illegally. So first and foremost, when we run into a client who wants to buy a plot of land outside of the province or the city of BA or the province of BA is, first thing we ask a colleague is, hey, is all the paperwork, is there a deed? 
and they might say yes and they might say no. So that immediately out of the gate will, will create a cultural difference, um, a timetable difference. It isn't to say you can't buy it. You can absolutely buy it. But do you want to take that risk is the question. And so invariably, our answer to that is no. But at the end of the day, we do what the client says. Thanks for that. Uh, here we have another question. If I transfer dollars to an Argentinian bank account, can I take the money out in dollars? I thought there was a problem with obtaining dollars. Or can I transfer the dollars to the seller's bank account in dollars? Well, that's one of the first things we try to do. We try to play matchmaker to a foreign buyer and a foreign seller or otherwise people who can, um, an Argentine who might have an account overseas and therefore make it more seamless. Now, as a foreigner, yes, you can absolutely transfer money into an Argentine bank. The account that you will open has to be under your name as the buyer. Now, the two problems that I have with that, and, and I'm, I'm not saying by any means that you should go the under the radar way, but the trouble that I have with this uh, method is that A, you're wiring money into an Argentine bank. That money is being converted into pesos, taxed, and converted then back into dollars. Now, mercurial as the Argentine economy and bank system can be, you may be wiring $100,000 and taking out $99,000, $99.5,000, $102,000. You don't know. And so that is a risk which I would just as soon not tell people to, 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 to go under. And the other problem is um, Argentine banks, uh, from time to time, they've had collapses, the most recent one being in 2002, when if you had dollars there, um, they were locked and you couldn't take them out. So in a nutshell, as an Argentine citizen, I would say... Uh, putting money in an Argentine bank for dollars in an Argentine bank uh, for however short a period of time is not my preferred method of, of doing business. Now, I do think for what it's worth that if the current government, the incoming, the new government plays their cards right, this is going to change. We're going to go more and more towards what I would like to call a first world, dignified, serious uh, country, respected the world over. Okay, great. We have two more questions. Hi, Max. What's stopping a seller? Uh, sorry. What's stopping a seller with a foreign bank account from taking the buyer's money and disappear disappearing? What's stopping a seller? Could you read it again? What's stopping a seller from a foreign What's, bank? What is stopping a seller with a uh, with a foreign bank account from taking the buyer's money and disappearing? Ah, okay, I understand. Yeah, what would be the risk? How does the buyer know? How does the interested party? I think the question is, how do I know that the seller is not going to abscond with my money? Um, which is a good question. Now, in deals such as those, um, what we do typically is. Everyone meets before the notary public and uh, the money is, is wired and one deed is signed indicating that the money has been, the wire has been initiated. Uh, a second deed is signed when confirmation of that wire arrives. Um, so there are two documents which are signed and that is what uh, ensures the safety for both parties. Now, in some cases, what we've done is we have hired an escrow company in the United States to present the buyer, the seller with more, um, more confidence. Uh, that would be the answer to the question. But let me go back one step and say that at least in real estate, I think that in many walks of life, but I think in real estate, uh, we have a saying, which is, Saber con que bueyes está jarando, which is basically know who you're dealing with. So if you go into a deal and it seems like all the boxes are checked and the answers to the questions come quickly and everything is being explained and we've met with the parties and there's a recommendation that everything is going well and you're working with someone that you know or is otherwise recommended, then 
uh, there's no cause for concern with something like that happening. Um, think of it this way. You're looking to buy um, a new phone on Amazon. And this is a very bad example, maybe, but think of it this way. You're looking to buy a new, a new phone on Amazon. More likely than not, what you're going to do is you're going to buy it from the seller who's got 2,300 4.5 star reviews, as opposed to the guy who just has two or three. Uh, you're going to do your due diligence. That's going to come along with our due diligence. Um, and, and there will be a synthesis of that to be done. And that will put you at ease that, that, that there's not going to be any problem. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, and, and all of these steps are taken so that something like that doesn't happen. Great. We are almost uh, on time. So we are, we are getting new, new questions. I don't think we have a, a enough time for all of them, but I'm going to read if it's okay with you. Uh, last one. Of course. And then if anybody wants to, if, if you want them to send those questions along via email, uh, I'm more than happy to respond via email. Not a problem. Sure, we will put your information on YouTube so everybody can uh, reach you. Excellent. So, last question: Do you have an average price difference between the listed prices versus the final price uh, the proper the property sold? That's an excellent question, and uh, it's a, it's a, the answer to that is anywhere between. Uh, uh, 10 and 15, it's not out of the realm of possibility to make an offer 10% below, even in some cases, 15% below. And this day and age, uh, the pandemic and onwards uh, with the buyer's market and especially 2022 and 21, you could see things go for as low as 20 or 30% below asking. Yeah, you can see some very, very, very motivated buyers um, I'm sorry, sellers who were really looking to uh, divest or sell or whatever. Um, I think that that it, all things being equal, there's still going to be this year a window for this still being a buyer's market because Argentine macroeconomics are not going to change anytime soon. This this year for us, Argentines is still going to be pretty bad. So I think the buyer's market will continue, even though people will very slowly start to rise their, uh, raise their, their, their asking prices. But yes, I think anywhere between 8%, 12% is, is reasonable to assume. And you can see things for up to a 15% differential, uh, generally speaking. Well, uh, Max, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for thank you. all the people who participated in this webinar. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you in the next webinar. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.